and welcome to 15 Minutes with Longevity. I'm Giselle Wertheim Ames and I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight we'll be speaking to Dr. Dave Anderson. He's a neurologist from the Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center. And we're gonna be talking about epilepsy, how it affects the lives of those who have it and the best ways to cope with it. So thank you for coming to the studio, Dr. Anderson. First of all, what is epilepsy? How, does, how, how do we know what it is? How does it present itself in, in people? Epilepsy is probably the most severe and common of the neurological disorders. It is not just one disease. It's several diseases which we put under the umbrella term epilepsy. And the definition, strictly, strictly speaking, is um, a, a disorder with a change in a person's uh, presence. So either they can have a change in their level of consciousness, a change in what they're experiencing, or a change in their body movements. Um, and on a neurological basis, it's really it's the uh, misfiring and abnormal firing and hyperfiring, increased firing of nerves inside the brain. How does that happen? Is that something you're born with? Do you develop it? Does it get triggered by something? Well, as I said, it's, it's, it's multiple diseases. And okay. it really, if we, if we go back to the strict definition of what epilepsy is, and you say that epilepsy is the disease of multiple seizures, and a seizure is the multiple firing of, of nerve cells within the brain, well, it can be from anything. So the most common c cause around the world is genetic epilepsy or inherited epilepsy. Okay. And that makes up about two thirds of all epilepsies that we know about. Um, and it is non-discriminating, it can occur at really any age, but it seems to focus in the first two decades of life and then towards the end of life as well. And, if, and are there other ways obviously of getting epilepsy, I understand it could be triggered by a traumatic, a traumatic accident or something like that? Sure, absolutely. So um, trauma is, 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 a common, is a common cause, um, but also uh, in developing countries, infections. Mm -hmm. are, a, are a big cause. Uh, in South Africa specifically, tuberculosis uh, and infections associated with HIV, as well as parasitic infections uh, are one of the leading causes of epilepsy in South Africa. So does South Africa present epilepsy? I mean, do we have different stats on epilepsy? Do we have more people getting epilepsy because we have very high HIV and, and TB stats? Well, the, the only robust figures that we have were from a study uh, about 10 years ago looking at uh, uh, children. And about just under one in every hundred children in rural South Africa has epilepsy, which Could is... Be. That's high, actually. Wow. If we look at the world statistics, ab about uh, three people in every 100 will have the diagnosis of epilepsy in their lifetime. So it's, so it's a very common disease. Okay. But remembering that some of the childhood epilepsies one cannot grow, and obviously the, the diagnosis later on in life is more common with uh, strokes and associated sure. diseases of aging. The, the epilepsy, you say you can outgrow it, but is it something that can be cured? So the treatment is complex. Um, the good news is, is that if you diagnose the condition correctly, um, in other words, you get the right type of epilepsy, you get the right kind of medication, about two thirds of epileptic patients will go into remission, in other mm -hmm. words, not have seizures. Okay. Um, there is that one third, however, that will remain uh, will continue to have seizures and that is obviously uh, uh, very disruptive because epilepsy unlike blood pressure and cholesterol where you chat to your doctor about it, the doctor gives you some medication and then you come back next week to see if the medication is working. Epilepsy you have to wait and see if your medication is working. How long so do you wait? It really depends on the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. So in some people they're having a seizure every week and then you know within a month whether or not the medication's working. In some people where they have infrequent seizures, you end up waiting six months. And obviously there's all the anxieties that are associated with that. That must be quite challenging, I think, in the South African context because I'm sure there are many people, first of all, who don't know they, they have this, I would assume, we have a, a level of, of low health literacy amongst a greater population. So are there a lot of people who don't know they've got epilepsy and aren't being treated for it? Yes, very much so. Um, in fact, uh, there are a few publications which are going to be taken to the uh, large international meeting this year from South Africa, looking at how rural Africa views epilepsy. Obviously, it's a condition that even 2,000 years ago was seen with a lot of superstition. Mm. Um, and it does, uh, it, it often gets misdiagnosed and mistreated in, in, in rural parts of our country. So people, I, I have read about that people think that people are possessed when they have these kind of fits when actually it's just a medical condition. 
And that's not only in Africa. Yeah. You know, we still see it in certain parts of uh, in religious backgrounds and uh, yeah. westernized religious backgrounds. So there's still a lot of superstition around epilepsy. When, you, when a person is having an epileptic fit, what are the chances of them actually dying from that fit? Are they, yeah, or is it what happens during the fit that is really more the risk? There's, 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 two, there's two parts to that question. The first part is it depends on when the seizure happens and what they're doing at the time. If a patient with, uh, with epilepsy has a seizure and they're busy driving, obviously the chances of injuring themselves or somebody else is significant. Um, there is a condition called SUDEP, which many epilepsy patients are not aware of. It stands for sudden unexplained uh, deaths in epilepsy patients, where patients suddenly die in their sleep. And it is related to, to having a seizure, um, often when patients stop their medication. There is a m big increase in sudden death in patients with epilepsy, both from trauma and from non-trauma related. It's a threefold increase, approximately, de depending on which population you're looking at. And accidents that are related to that, I mean, I was reading about that terrible story in the papers today about that young boy who fell into a fire and has had now both his arms amputated. Really horrific story, and that was through an epileptic fit. Now I've got patients who have uh, drowned in bathtubs, drowned in swimming pools, burnt themselves with hot oil. And it comes down to education. If a patient is uncontrolled and you're not sure about what their seizure is like, I think you know, you've got to be prudent at the beginning of of, of, of this path that you're walking with the patient and education, education, education is very important with all these patients. Okay. So what happens during a seizure, the actual physical, what happens to the person? Well, it depends on where the seizure is starting. Um, the two big groups of epilepsy are what we call the, the focal onset, where it starts in one part of the brain and then the generalized seizures, where the whole brain has a seizure at the same time. With the focal epilepsies, it depends on which part of the brain it's starting in. So if it starts in the part of the brain that's responsible for memory, a person can suddenly get a deja vu or a memory from a past event. Okay. If it starts in another part of the body, it can be a small twitching of the muscle. So it really depends on the, on the area. But the majority of epilepsies are generalized and there isn't a warning. And they lose consciousness, they can drop to the ground, and they can have different forms of motor, motor movements, which the lay person would see as a convulsion. And what do we do when we are around a person who has a, who is having a seizure? Is there, I mean, obviously we're not all trained for first aid, but are there just very really some basic rules around that? What you should do? It's always very surprising and dramatic um, mm -hmm. to see a person having a seizure. The, f the first thing to to try and remember is that most seizures stop themselves within two to three minutes. A lot of people try and put things in the patient's mouth, and that's usually either in injures the patient or, or injures the person trying to put something in the mouth. So that's the first rule. Once the seizure has stopped to turn the patient onto their side, um, allow them to carry on breathing, afterwards they could be confused and then to be supportive. The two real emergencies are when the patient doesn't stop seizuring after three minutes, then you need to call an ambulance and get, uh, okay. and get uh, paramedics involved, or if they stop seizuring and then within a few minutes start seizuring again, that could um, be the warnings of a condition called status epilepticus where the seizure doesn't stop and could result in the patient dying. But you also have to bear in mind that that's quite a rare syndrome to see. And the person themselves, they, are com they absolutely have no control over that particular seizure. I mean, are they in a part conscious state or? Well, in some seizures, um, a person can be conscious and they have all these changes to their sensorum, to what they're experiencing. Um, but a patient cannot control their seizures. Um, and that's what makes it such a, such a difficult disease. Um, you never know when it's going to strike. There are certain things which can provoke a seizure. Alcohol, stress, uh, certain antibiotics even can, oh, really? can precipitate seizures. Yeah. But it is unpredictable. The word epilepsy comes from ancient Greek, which means to be seized upon, whether it just, you know, sort yeah. of tells you how unpredictable, unpredictable it is. So there must be quite a lot of sort of counseling that goes with people who suffer from this because the psychology of that must be really tough, knowing that you have this, even if you're on medication, which I understand you have to be, correct, um, if you suffer from, from these types of seizures. Yes, medication is essential. So how do, uh, what kind of support do, do, do they get um, from this? How, how do you work with it? What kind of advice is given? There isn't enough support in South Africa. Um, there aren't enough people really dedicating their time to epilepsy in South Africa. Um, however, having said that, Epilepsy South Africa, the support group, are offering a, a great support service. But each patient is, is unique and you can't just, you know, each patient needs a, a different approach. Um, but ed once you've educated the patient, like any patient who's had a traumatic experience, whether it's a hijacking or a significant diagnosis like cancer, 
there's a, a, a road you have to travel, and that requires psychotherapy. Sometimes it requires a certain amount of um, re-education, and often you have to educate the family. In fact, even more so. In yeah, the I was going to say, I'm sure that this really requires quite a strong support group around it. Yeah. Um, this type of disease, Definitely. and um, the medication itself is it. I mean, does it have very adverse consequences on people's health having to be on medication like this all your life? The, the medications are changing. Um, there is no perfect drug that you take once a day with no side effects and stops all seizures. That's what we're looking for. Um, and because there are so many different types of epilepsy, there is now an entire bouquet of medications to choose from. And in some cases, especially some of the older drugs, the side effects are significant. So you've got to really... What would some of those be? Uh, weight gain, cognitive problems, okay. liver dysfunction, hair loss, teeth falling out. All the things really that people really don't want. <laughs> but some, some yeah. of the newer drugs have almost no side effects okay. at all. Um, but you've got to choose the right drug for the right, for the right disease. Right. And then once that medication has been used, you have to communicate with the patient and make sure that it's, it's something that they can live with because obviously that has to do with compliance and yeah. the patient taking their drug. We were talking earlier on about whether there was enough awareness or support around epilepsy. And I'm quite interested to know from a framework, a legal framework, how is this governed as an, as an illness? Are there guidelines for people who have this in terms of what they can and can't do? Um, laws, I understand in the US, for example, that you you're not allowed to drive or there's certain restrictions on your driving if you, if you are subject to seizures? Many countries around the world do have uh, a, a blanket law saying that if you've had a seizure within a certain period of time, you're not allowed to drive or operate heavy machinery or even and sometimes just uh, basic uh, home tools um, for, for a certain period of time. That's changing. Uh, in the UK, um, it was two years. They're looking at that to make it one year. In South Africa, the Road Traffic Act stipulates um, that it's at the discretion of the neurologist or the treating oh, physician. Really? Okay. Um, but, and there is, a, there is a, a feeling that it should be two years amongst, amongst the, the, the neurologists in South Africa. However, it hasn't really been tested in a court of law yet. Um, we do know, however, that if a patient drives and they've been told by their physician not to, that the insurance companies will not pay if they're in an accident of any type whatsoever. Okay. And there's a lot of responsibility on the part of the patient here in South Africa. Well, that's very interesting, and I think it's pretty enlightening, and certainly I've learned a lot about ep epilepsy this evening. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. That's it for tonight. Thanks a lot for joining us. Tune in next week, where we'll be discussing what women should be looking out for when it comes to their own health. Stay well, be healthy, and I hope to see you here next week for your dose of health news.